distance far away Rising he just fall apart You're the one that guides my heart Lord I need you Oh I need you Every hour I need you My one defense just Temptation comes my way When I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay It's when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Good morning, church. I invite you all to stand with us as we worship our God, focus, focus our eyes and fix our hearts on him. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come, and I simply come longing just to bring 
something that's worth that I will bless your heart and I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart and I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it when it's all about you it's all about you jesus king of endless words no one could express how much you deserve long weekend poor all i Every single breath and I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Amen. Christ alone, my hope is found, and He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, and firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when strife
presence in life, no fear in death, and this is the power of Christ in me. stand in the power of Christ, but you may be seated. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Good morning to everybody that's online, and good morning to everybody that's gathering with us today. And if we have someone that's with us for the first time, we would really appreciate it if you would fill out what's called a contact card. And that card is on the back of the pew in front of you. And you can just place that in the offering boxes in the back as you uh, leave today. And for those of you that are with us for the first time online or, or maybe have yet to uh, make a contact with our church, you can do that by going to our website. And at the top of our home page, there is a contact us and you can push that, and you can fill out that information, and that will go straight to our office manager. And uh, she'd be glad to answer any questions you might have, but we'd, we'd like to have opportunity to get to know you better through that way. I've got a few announcements today. Uh, is Hannah Fisher here? Okay, I'm hoping that she's gonna be here because there's a nursery meeting at your church, and she's in charge of it. So, <laughs> do you guys know if Hannah's going to be here today? Okay, okay. So, we're going to plan by faith, okay, that <laughs> Hannah Fisher is going to be here, and that meeting is going to be in the nursery. And uh, we had the blessing of having a lot of children here. Uh, there were 13 children in the nursery last week. So, uh, she'd like to meet with those of you that are already helping with nursery and, and possibly those of you that would be interested in, in helping uh, with this great need that we have. I think they want to uh, have an extra adult in there for every uh, Sunday morning to help out with that ministry. We've got a few things going on this week. We have our prayer meeting here Wednesday at 7 and Awana's on Tuesday at 6.15. How many of you folks like to go to Rib City? Raise your hand. Okay. I just learned that they have a program that's called Show Your Colors. Now, if I went to Rib City today, I'd show them my colors. Okay. So, I'm pretty proud of that. I got that from Pastor Sam. I have my Mahomes hair today, but I didn't want to wear that yet. I'll put it on after the service. But... Uh, Show your colors. What's that about? Well, you get your receipt, and then you uh, have them stamp the back of your receipt, and you return that to the church office. They're collected, and then they go back to Rib City. Sounds kind of complex, doesn't it? Well, after that, then we get some money from that, which is cool. I understand that $50 came in the mail from Rib City, and that's, that's very helpful because we can invest that in something that lasts longer than food. Pretty cool, huh? So, if you brought your offering today, you can place that in the offering back boxes as you go out today. And uh, I'd like to read some scripture to uh, warm us up today for the message. Um, it's from Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. Not that I have already attained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay a hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. 
I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have already attained. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that we have the privilege of coming before you today. And we do want you to be worshipped from our hearts. We also, Father, just come before you as your children and know that we are yours. And, and, and we need you to help us to press forward. Help us to align our priorities with your priorities. Help us, Lord, to have an eternal perspective. Help us to have your perspective. Help us to see how you have laid a hold of us for the sake of Christ Jesus who lives in us, who desires to move us in your direction, to, 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 to work in our lives in such a way that we would continue his ministry here on earth. And so, Father, in a very personal way today, we ask from you that, one, would you speak to us through your word today, through Pastor Sam, and please enable him through your spirit to teach, to teach us. Enable us by your spirit to be able to learn. And enable us by your spirit to be able to have the power to be able to walk with you and to, to really have a desire to, to move ahead in our relationship with you and a desire to walk with you on a daily basis. We ask these things in the precious name of our Savior. Amen. Amen. You please stand with us in worship. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word and just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. And oh, how sweet. In Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge beneath the healing, cleansing blood. And Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him. How I proved him more and more, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus. From sin itself to cease, just from Jesus' simply take life and rest and joy and peace. And Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove. I 
so glad I've tasted and seen that you are good. I know you, Father. I experience you. You are my King. You're my Lord. And it is so sweet to be in fellowship with you, Father. skill to understand what God has willed, what God has planned. I only know at His right hand stands one who is my Savior. I take Him at His word and Christ died to save me this time. And in my heart I find the My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God, He's always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God, He's always gonna be. Yes, living, dying, My strength, my soul, has found in the spring. That he who lives to be my king. Once died to be my savior. That he would leave his place on high. And come for sin. So once did I Before I knew my Savior And my Savior loves My Savior lives My Savior's always there for me My God, He was My God, He is My God, He's always gonna be My Savior loves My Savior lives My Savior's always there for me my God, He was, my God, He is, my God, He's always gonna be.
Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always going to be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always going to be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God, He's always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God, He's always gonna be. And my Savior lives, my Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior loves, my Savior lives. Father, we declare it and we know it. You are Savior. You are my God. You were and you are and you're always going to be. We praise you for the promise of just who you are, Father. Just your character, just who you are is enough. And what you've done through Jesus. We praise you, Father. We're so grateful. Thank you for all that you are. All right, children, you are dismissed, age three to third grade. Parents, if you're checking in your kids for the first time, please uh, go back with them. Go back with them. Otherwise, you're always free to keep them with you in the service if you would like. I got to get over a moment. I had to break out the tissue. <laughs> Uh, during worship, just singing to the Lord and praising Him. Um, but right, I mean, parents that know the Lord and love the Lord, one of the things that you want more than anything is that your children would know the Lord and love the Lord. Okay? Uh, I told my son after his rehearsal this morning, I said, Son, I love good music but I came here to worship. Lead me in worship. Lead me in worship. And so I praise God that, that that's his heart too, is to lead us in worship. So I can't, I can't look at you. <laughs> I get, I'll get weepy. So I am also, I'm grateful for how God raises us up and he, he wants us to know him, to love him, to live for him. And to serve him and, and this way or that way, the other way, I'm, I'm grateful uh, for those that are serving in the nursery. Uh, I'm grateful for Hannah Fisher in particular, too, and how she volunteered to help take the coordinator role for that. And she sees it as a ministry. Um, she gave out some Bibles recently to moms, uh, praying through the Bible for your children. And there was one mom in particular that felt really blessed by that. And I just thought, what? That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. Um, by the way, I have sermon slides. Can you hook me up and click on that for me? Thanks. <laughs> what comes to mind? Can you click on that again? Okay, thank you. What comes to mind when you see that? How cute, how precious, how innocent. That's beautiful, right? How about this? <laughs> Have you ever felt the, uh, the urge to tell somebody, Can, will you stop acting like a baby? You need to get your act together. You need to grow up. <laughs> you know, I, I, as I was working on this message, I had a flashback. I remembered when I turned 20, 
By the time I was 20, I was living in Germany on my own as in the Air Force, air traffic controller. Uh, I had grown up in the church. I did Bible drills. And now I'm involved in a single Christian group. And, and, I, and I found myself, I was like, wow, I, I actually know a lot about the Bible. I know a lot about the Bible. I'm, I've, I've taken some, gone through some trials already with the military. And, uh, and I had gotten compliments here and there of, you know, you're pretty mature for your age. I don't hear that very much anymore. I, <laughs> I don't know what, what's happening there. Because I, I remember, I remember turning 20 and I was like, oh, man. I'm getting old. <laughs> That's what I thought when I turned 20. I was like, you know, everybody gets old whether they like it or not. If you're going to be on this side of heaven, you're just going to get older. And I thought, oh, man, it's happening. I, and I said it then. I was like, you know, everybody gets old, but not everybody matures. And I said that when I was 20, 21. Not everybody matures. You know why? Because that takes work. <laughs> that takes work. It doesn't take work to get old. You just get old. <laughs> going to hear an Amen. <laughs> And so recently, I had a conversation with a, a guy, and I, I turned 50 this year, by the way. I turned 50. And I, and I had to stop and ask myself, you know, am I going to be who I hoped I would be by, by age 50? I mean, right? It's like, am I going to be this? Am I going to be this guy when I turn 50? I mean, back in the day, I was like, you know, that's, you're supposed to be a mature man. I'm like, am I going to be a mature man by then? I got, I got less than a year to, to get there. And what about when I'm 60? What about 60? What does that look like for me? What kind of man do I want to be? Am I just going to have the same hang-ups that I've, I still have? I'm always going to have them. And I, and I just, you know, I still fly off the handle if I can't install that ceiling fan correctly. Remember that story? <laughs> you know, is that, am I still going to be like that 10 years from now? Am I still going to struggle with this and that? Or am I, am I going to actually make some progress over some time? You know, uh, am I still growing? Am I still maturing? Well, that's going to take a little effort, isn't it? You know, one reason why I picked the book of Hebrews um, to try to, to study and to teach through is because one reason why is because I thought it would be hard. <laughs> I was like, you know, everybody says, that's a difficult book. And I'm like, let's do that one then. Let's do that one. Why not? Of course, the Lord was like, hold on, buddy. Because <laughs> I prayed about that like a year ago. And he was like, no, you're not ready yet. You keep praying. But that's part of, I, I'm just being honest with you. That was one small part of my motivation of teaching this book is because I thought it would be hard. But I thought, I need to know God's word. And I don't want to be afraid of God's word. And God's word, he, he speaks through all of it, we believe. And so what an opportunity to be challenged, to understand a maybe more difficult book of the Bible. And how rewarding will that be? Right? The, I, so I've heard this. I've seen this. I've read this. The book of Hebrews, reputation for being rich and deep. One of the more difficult books of the New Testament to thoroughly understand or to explain. Even the writer himself says this. He takes a moment here and there to challenge his listeners to, to pay attention <laughs> and to rise to the occasion, to dig deep. And we're hitting one of those sections right now. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. Electronic or hard copy, Let's, I encourage you, eyes on the page. Hebrews chapter 5, I'm going to start at verse 11. Yeah. I'm just going to take it one verse at a time. Hebrews 5.11, he starts off by saying, about this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have been dull of hearing. Okay, so he says, about this, uh, maybe your translation says, concerning him, um, that the, the one particular Greek word, it can go either way. So what is the, what is the writer referring to, or who is he referring to? Right, You've got to look backwards. So we look backwards at verse 10. He just got finished explaining, and this is what I did. Oh, last week was a mess, wasn't it? Welcome back, right? <laughs> Welcome back. I thought I was going to record the message from home, 
and I couldn't upload it in time. My computer froze up, and so I came here, and David came here to help, and I was like, brother, I think we're going live. <laughs> so here I was. And uh, so last week I preached through uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 5, verse 1 through 10, and he's talking now about Jesus being our new high priest. Being our new high priest, and he finishes off by saying, in the order designated high priest in the order of Melchizedek, and now he says about this, or concerning him, I have more to say, but I'm concerned. <laughs> I need to take a moment to challenge you. Um, Jesus becoming the new high priest, not in the order of Aaron, which they were used to, but in the order of Melchizedek, who they kind of had heard of. Everyone, oh, by the way, let me make one quick comment too. When I say concerning him, or maybe it's translated as about this, uh, the re, one of the resources I use that you can use is BibleHub.com. If you go to BibleHub.com and you type in a scripture, if you just typed in, okay, uh, Hebrews 5, 11, whatever, it will show you different translations, okay? It'll show you what the NIV, how it words it. Uh, the uh, ESV, it'll show you how that words it, NESB, okay? And so it can break it up for you, and you can see a little bit what I'm talking about. Sometimes they're lining up, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Going from the Greek to the English seems pretty clear, and other times it's, you see them turn it, maybe diff, use a different word, which means it's not quite as simple. Everyone's in a different place. Everyone's in a different place. Maybe you just, you're like, you know what, brother? I, I'm just trying to show up at church every Sunday, <laughs> And maybe that's where you're at. I'm just showing up. I'm just trying to show up. This is a lot for me. I, didn't, I haven't always come to church on a regular basis. And I, I'm certainly not used to these longer sermons. Um, when I came from, it was like 15, 20 minutes and he was done. And you just can't seem to be done. Um, it's like 40, 45 minutes. You're done, right? In conclusion. Um, and so maybe, maybe that's where you're at. And that's fine. It, or maybe you just started reading the Bible more consistently. You're like, you know, I've never really read the Bible. I need to start reading it, so I'm going to figure out how to read it more consistently at night or in the morning. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe I had a lunch with a guy recently, and he told me, he says, man, do you have a recommendation for a good study Bible? Because I'm, uh, we have Scripture reading. We're reading through the Scriptures, but I'm hitting certain spots. I'm like, man, I don't understand what he meant by that. I mean, is there some background to this? Jesus is telling them, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring division. Whoa, since when? I mean, is there a study Bible that just kind of explains why he said that? And so we had a great conversation. Maybe you have a study Bible, and you're used to looking down at those notes, and you're just getting to a point where like, man, I just, I got these other, I have these other questions that are not being answered. Is there something more? And so, for, you know, and this guy and I had that conversation, and I, I showed him. I said, you know, I've got this one particular commentary that's not overwhelming. It, it's a pretty easy read. There's one per book of the Bible, and it's entitled Understanding the Bible Commentary Series. I like it because it gives me a little background on certain passages. And it gives me a little bit of background on, a, on the language, but not, not too overwhelming. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you'll consider, maybe, I need to get an extra book that dives in a little bit deeper. For me, I have six commentaries that I use because he doesn't answer the question I had, but he does. And so, to each their own. I mean, take the next step. Don't let up. Think about it. We've got a new year in front of us, okay? We don't want to let up. We, won't, we, won't, we don't want to start settling we don't want to become lazy. And I think that's, that's what the writer is saying right off the bat here. He said, we, we have much to say. I have much to say. But it's hard to explain because you have become dull of hearing. Sluggish is the word. You've gotten a little lazy. I came across this quote. It said, their sluggishness showed itself in a disposition to settle down at the point which they had reached. Since to go farther would have meant too complete a severing of old ties. Okay, so remember his audience. He's writing to Jewish Christians. 
to such people the exposition of the high priestly service of Christ with the corollary that the old order of priesthood and sacrifice has been abolished once for all, it might well have been unacceptable. The intellect is not over ready to entertain an idea that the heart finds unpalatable. They were growing and learning about the relationship with Jesus, how he fulfilled everything, and so there were certain things that they weren't doing anymore. And that seemed really odd. I mean, when you became a true believer of Jesus, your life changed. God initiated a relationship with you when you were born into his family. The rest of your life is about understanding and embracing the new relationship with God, never forgetting how he brought, you, how he brought it about and learning to apply his truth and grace to every area of your life for the rest of your life, growing in your relationship with God and helping others to come to know and love and also grow in their relationship with the Lord. That's the plan. That's the plan. But sometimes we start to get off track. We start to get a little lazy, a little sluggish. We start to forget what we know we find ourselves just checking boxes, but somehow at some time, and we start to atrophy spiritually. I mean, listen, listen to what the, the writer says next in verse 12. It says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again. The basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Can you imagine somebody saying that to you? Not today, right? <laughs> you might get... Oh, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> right. He says you ought to be teachers. God wants, wants us to understand his word, for, not only for our sake, but also for the sake of others. He's placed people in our lives. In their case, there were other Jews that were holding on to the, tradition, to the traditions, they didn't understand what Jesus fulfilled, and they needed help understanding that. They needed to be taught. And in this verse, he, he says the oracles of God or the, the words of God, this particular word shows up in the New Testament a few times, and it, and it seems in those cases it's referring to the Old Testament. But here, it seems clear he's talking about the gospel, the good news that Jesus brought and his disciples taught, which is still a proclamation of God at the same authoritative level as anything in the Old Testament, which he stressed in Hebrews 2. And this is important for them. They had a high view of Scripture in the, of the Old Testament. And so there's writers saying what was been taught by the Lord and the disciples is equal in authority. And so he said to them in Hebrews 2, right, he teaches a little bit and then he has to challenge them. He says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, he's referring to the law in the Old Testament, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation, the good news, the gospel. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So just to drive home the point, to rile them up just a little bit, to help them to sit up and take note of what they need to be doing, he starts using what we might refer to as a little bit of sarcasm, I guess. Okay, in the next, in this verse, you need milk, not solid food. Everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's a child, unskilled, inexperienced. Again, for what purpose? What did he just say? He commented about them. You, at this point, you should be teachers. You should be helping other people, and that takes skill. Knowing the gospel well enough not only to live it out, but also to explain it to others. This word of righteousness, this principle of righteousness. 
And now on the next verse, he goes on to say a little bit more about being mature. Verse 14. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment or their senses trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. I mean, we experience this on an emotional and intellectual level as we grow up. We learn to deal with things. And hopefully God's designed it, right, where parents are in our life and, and they're helping us to deal with emotional and relational, intellectual challenges so that we can continue to grow and mature and discern and distinguish. In some ways, we choose it. We learn. We decide to learn something. We push ourselves. We decide to read, to study, to go to school, whatever. Go through some type of training. We push ourselves. Give, put ourselves in experience that would we believe might stretch us and help us to grow in some ways. Or we're just working through things that come our way, <laughs> right? Trying to handle things uh, a little more maturely than we did last time. And so we're working. And that's just the emotional, relational level. Make no mistake, God wants us to grow spiritually. He wants us to grow spiritually. He wants us to mature. Uh, listen to what Paul says. Ephesians 4 And he gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to maturity, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and from by the waves and carried about every word of doctrine by human cunning by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So he's saying, spiritually, God doesn't want us to remain children. He wants us to mature. And it's, it will benefit us because we have a lot of stuff that comes our way. I remember as a kid, I thought all men are created equal was in the Bible. <laughs> I told a friend that, you know, the Bible says <laughs> all men are created equal. That's a little embarrassing. Even though it kind of is, right? It kind of is. There's other teachings in the scriptures that bring that out. That is a, a biblical truth that we're all equal before God. But we all are just learning. We're growing. Learning about what the Bible says, and that takes effort. When it says in that last verse, right, by constant practice to distinguish good, so trained, trained by constant practice. That's the Greek word for that, the root of it. Whoops. Now, that's the, what, I, what we call is the transliteration. A transliteration, so there's a translation. I'm trying to take words and sentences from the original Greek language, and I'm trying to put it into English, and it makes sure it matches up in meaning as close as possible. Here and there, what we have is what we call a transliteration where I take every, I don't, but other people do, smart people do. They take every letter of the Greek and translate that to an English letter. So that little squiggly thing at the beginning for us would have a G sound to it. What does that look like to you? <laughs> Jim? How about that, huh? Spiritual maturity doesn't happen by accident. You're not going to get strong and healthy by accident. This is what Paul said to his protege, Timothy. He said, if you put these things before the brothers, so you're, he's sharing, he's teaching, even as a young man, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths, rather train yourselves for godliness. And we understand that. If we need to grow and mature in some area of our life, there's things that we need to say yes to, and there's things we need to say no to. And that's pretty much what he was telling him. But the overall idea is that you got to make an effort. You make an effort. We keep growing. And we help others along the way, which has, as I was talking to somebody else recently about, has a nice little kickback. 
I, I love hearing from our children's church workers. <laughs> at, at least two different sets of them were like, man, I have learned so much. I've learned so much by being involved and preparing lessons, trying to make sure that I understand it and then I teach it well to the kids. I am learning so much. I think that's part of God's design too. And there's a concern that the writer of Hebrews has for his congregation, for his people, that may have been similar to Paul's concern for Timothy. They were Jewish. They were facing a measure of persecution, suffering as they were growing in their faith in Jesus, understanding that he fulfilled everything necessary for right standing with God the Father. And they, have been, they may have been tempted to shrink back and to not to set themselves too far apart from their non-believing Jewish family members, friends, and neighbors. The day is coming for us, isn't it? I still remember when I lived in Maryland and I went to high school there. And for me to say I was a Christian made me stand out in not a good way. Especially when I'm in a class and it's study time and everybody just wants to cheat. And at one point, I went along with them, and then I, I got convicted by it, and I got confronted by that, and I realized I had to repent because that wasn't living for Jesus. And so the day came where all of a sudden they were like, hey, give us your answers, and I had to say no. And next thing you know, I find out that my name is written on the, the baseball dugout. Sam Cathy is a whatever. And that was part of me just learning how to walk with Jesus through persecution. And then my sophomore year in high school, I moved to the mountains of North Carolina where everybody's a Christian. Not really, right? But everybody thought they were Christian, and it was kind of common knowledge. I, actually, there's a guy that I know here in town made the comment to me. He used to live in Breckenridge. Now he lives here in Fruta. And he says, you know, it's different here. Here, you can still ask the question, so what church do you go to? He said, you don't ask that question in Breckenridge. But I actually found a strange challenge that was different and almost harder in North Carolina. Because everybody thought they were Christian, and yet they, they weren't necessarily. People wanted you to blend in. You know, some of you... Some of us came from a Catholic background. And you still have Catholic friends or family that don't understand why you act like you don't have to go to the priest to confess your sins. Or take the Eucharist to, in order to maintain your salvation. Or pray to Mary or the saints. That's just one example. In their mind, you're like, they're just like, you, who do you think you are? You can't just go directly to God. And yet we say, hey, that's the gospel. That's the good news. So we end up setting ourselves apart. And all of a sudden, family reunions can be a little uncomfortable. <laughs> and so the writer is, is saying this to these folks. You look at the beginning of chapter 6. He says, therefore... Let us leave the, this, the elementary, the beginning doctrines of Christ, and let's go on to maturity. Let's press on. Let's go on. Let's press on. Let's endure. And that's interesting, right? This spot, he does, he's not just talking about them. He says, let us, let us. We are all maturing. We are all continuing to mature at some level and some way. Just because you think you're more spiritually mature than somebody else here doesn't mean God's done with you yet. Right? It's, it's not our approval that you need. <laughs> it's God's. I was sitting at home working on my sermon like months ago, and I, I had a moment where I was kind of wondering, okay, how else do you want me to grow this year, Lord? How do you want me to grow? And in that moment, I, what he revealed to me was, you need to learn how to suffer. And I was like, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, right? It's not what I'm looking for here. He's like, 
And it always, he had these moments where it's like, who's the Lord? <laughs> who's going to be the Lord in my life? Am I going to do what he wants? Am I going to grow in the ways that he wants me, me to this year? He wants you to this year? It doesn't matter what other people think. Like I said, we're all in different places. This is what Paul said. Not that I've already attained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which for, for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, I forget, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. And I think that's part of what he was saying to the the readers here was, hey, you know the good news. You know this, don't. You need to remember that you know this. And continue to grow. And one of the ways that we grow is we do learn from others. We do learn from others. And so, therefore, we have to get close enough to each other to learn from others. This is what Paul continues to say in this passage. So, Philippians 3, moving on to verse 17. Listen to this. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, their glory is in their shame, with minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm. Thus in the Lord, my beloved. There's going to be people around you that are not interested in walking with Jesus. They're not interested in growing in a relationship with Jesus. And this is not what he's calling them to. He's challenging them, hey, come on, rise up. Rise up. And this is what Paul's saying when he said to the Ephesians, right? He was like, I've, I've put some people in place to help you grow spiritually, and you need to help each other so that we all grow up. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So it's not that they were just leaving, moving on from the basic truths of becoming a child of God. Rather, it was the foundation for everything that we learn and we do. The gospel is the foundation and the, that we grow in. And just like raising children, right? We raise them to eventually become responsible adults who in turn help raise others. And he says this foundation of repentance from dead works into faith toward God's repentance, turning to God from the things that would not save, sinful works, self-righteousness, turning to faith, Trust in God to the only one who could save, trusting in Jesus and as the means that he's provided. And so in this little section here, the writer goes on to just list some things, things that they've been taught that pertain to God's call, and I just want to comment on these things the best I can. His God's call to repent and to believe, verse 2, it says, And of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, an eternal judgment. Okay, so the, the writer just rattles these things off, and there's no lengthy explanation for what they mean. Exactly, not in this passage. But apparently, they were basics of the faith for them. Most likely, helping them understand what God has done through Jesus, fulfilling what they knew in their Jewish faith under the law into the new life with Jesus. And so he says, not laying again this foundation of instruction about washings, okay? 
Now, the word there is this, okay, in the Greek. And then if I transliterate, if I take every single one of those letters and just pull it into the English letter equivalent, I get that. Does that look familiar? Okay, so this is where we get baptism. I mean, they... For us, when I, when I see baptism, I think about, as a Christian today, my public profession of faith. I was baptized before the church, proclaiming that I personally have trusted in Jesus to be my Savior and my Lord. And I'm publicly professing that now. Now, the, the problem with this verse and this particular word here is it's plural. It's washings. Almost like saying baptisms. And so it just kind of makes some of us kind of pause and go, okay, what is he talking about here? I, I would have thought, are you talking about the baptism that I know of? But he, he made it plural. What's going on? And again, keeping in mind our audience here, the, the audience of the letter itself, they were Jewish. And for the Jews, they had rituals and they had reasons for, for cleansing more than we do today. There were certain times and places where they would have to wash their hands. And in other places, they had to be completely immersed. And it was all about cleansing for impurities, a physical act with spiritual meaning. And we see this with John and the disciples of Jesus, right? They were baptizing, and it didn't seem that unusual because they saw it as an act of repentance. I'm going to go out there, I need to repent of idolatry or sinful behavior, and I'm going to be baptized. I'm going to repent, turn to God, and the symbolism of being washed. But then, in Acts, we, we see now there is a, a new baptism that has, or at least the way it's being described, it has more meaning. And now we call it the Christian baptism, being baptized in the name of Jesus. It has an element of repentance in it, but it also expresses faith. Christian baptism is expression of faith. Listen to Paul describe this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were baptized therefore with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so the baptism, being buried with him in death, raised to newness of life. And that's usually some of the wording that we use when we baptize somebody that has expressed faith. We're saying, this is what's happened to you spiritually. You've died with Christ, and you're being raised with Christ now. And so we start to hit, like, right, the next section. Oh, let me back up. And so he's trying to help them to understand what Jesus has done and the meaning, even though there's historical stuff that they did that God set into place to help prepare them for the truth, he's trying to help them to understand the fulfillment of it. For us, we didn't, I didn't grow up Jewish. For me, I, all I knew was the baptism I experienced today. But for them, it was different. Same with the laying on of hands. Moses was commanded to lay his hands on Joshua. There was a blessing. There was a commissioning aspect to this act. It, it may be that that's what he's referring to. He, he just got finished talking how God appointed Jesus to be our high priest. And so we do see this practice in the New Testament with Christians, a laying on of hands in 1 Timothy for elders. He at one spot says, don't be too hasty on the laying on of hands commissioning people to serve at a high level of leadership in the church if they're not qualified, they're not proven faithful. Okay, I got a funny story for you. I grew up Baptist, and we had a whole ordination ceremony for the deacons. Have I already told you this story? Oh, my. My dad was being ordained as a deacon, and they, they were trying to follow that laying on of the hands. 
And so they had all the deacons all lined up, and they were on their knees, and they were facing the congregation. And then the pastor would come, and he would lay his hands on their head, and he'd pray for them. And he would just go from one man to the next. And he spent a long time with my dad for some reason, and I didn't know why. He was there, hands on my dad, long time. And then finally, he moved on to the next man. And my dad, he had the comb over, right? I mean, he did. He had the comb over. And so to keep that thing in place, you've got to use a little bit of hairspray, right? He's got the hairspray and he's got the comb over to hold it in. And, and it had kind of popped up. And he's smiling. And my family just, we lost it. We just started laughing because we could like see all like all the way in through and everything. And we're just like, oh, sorry, dad. Serious moment. And we're laughing. We're going we're gonna to die later. He's going to kill us for laughing at him. And then, but what's funny is he told us a story afterwards. The pastor had these big, sweaty hands. And so at one point, when he was done praying for my dad, he felt, my dad felt that the pastor lift his hands up and put him right back down. <laughs> and he, <laughs> and my dad thought, this poor man might think it's a toupee. And he's going to accidentally take my hair to the next man. <laughs> and so he's just rested there for a moment, probably trying to figure out what to do next. And my dad said he just kind of felt the pastor just start peeling his hands off my head. <laughs> All my sisters and I tell that story from time to time. And, I, you know, I, I don't know... Like I said in the beginning, the, the, the writer of Hebrew just rattles off this list and we're, just, we're kind of left guessing, what do you mean by that? What did you mean by laying on of hands? Was it, was it an ordination thing you're talking about or was it the, you know, another pli- spot? They're praying for people and, and the Holy Spirit is gifting them and acknowledging you know, before the church that they have this gifting and this role now to serve the church. It doesn't tell us. It just doesn't tell us. And so here's where... I always caution, you know, and that is, I, if somebody has a great explanation, they can show some other passages of Scripture that says exactly what it is, hey, that's great. But if they're just trying to be authoritative and, oh, yeah, I know what it means, I'll tell you what it means. I'm just going to listen closely what verses they, they say. Otherwise, I'm going to tell you, I'm not sure. <laughs> that's, that's my game. That's how I roll. I, I study it, and I, if I come up with an answer, great, I share it with you. If I don't, I go, I don't know. I think that's what it means. Get a commentary. Get a good one, and you'll see. So what is he talking about here? I I don't know for sure. He doesn't elaborate, and I think this is where it's important. The writer didn't know necessarily that we would be reading this in America. (laughs) God did. God did, and God ensured that everything that we would need to know is in there. Even though for us, sometimes there's some gaps here and there. And sometimes we can get a good, reasonable, true explanation for that gap, and sometimes we don't. And so let's be careful about shoving information into those gaps that may or may not be true, just because it makes it feel better, okay? Let there be gaps sometimes. It's okay. We have what we need right now to live for him until, until what? Until the resurrection of the dead. Until eternal judgment. It does seem like these are paired together, okay? The resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Again, this is something that is taught in the Old Testament. This is something that the Jews were taught. There's going to be a resurrection. There's going to be eternal judgment. And as a Christian, we would say... Yeah, that's right, there is. However, there's something even meaningful that's happened because Christ has been resurrected. Somehow that affects me in my relationship with God. There's power. There's the Holy Spirit. And so they're taking what they have been taught and they're saying, and this is what Jesus did. And there, there's, this is what it means. And there's even more meaning in there. I think that's what's happening in the scripture, in this passage. Although there's a richness about the resurrection of Jesus and how we'll benefit, it, benef- benefit from it 
later, we also benefit from it now. And everyone will face the judgment of God when they die. But now they understand that Jesus will also be judging. And people will be condemned not just for not obeying the law enough. They'll be condemned for not trusting in the means of grace that God has provided through Jesus. And that was different. That was different. We need to embrace the righteousness of Jesus through our new relationship with him and allow the gospel, the good news available, the grace available, to permeate our entire life. We need to grow in this. We need to mature as believers. And we will do this if God permits. That's what this writer says. Spiritual growth does not happen without God's permission nor without his help. nor without our cooperation. Now, some of you have experienced this. You, you realized, I, I, I just, I need to get to know the Lord better. I need to get to know his word better. And so you realize, you know, it's just going to take one step at a time. I just need to start reading. I need to start studying. I need to have conversations. I need to start praying a little bit more. And then all of a sudden, a little bit of time passes, and then all of a sudden, you find yourself sharing with somebody else, and then all this information starts coming out of your mouth. To be helpful to them, truths, and even you're amazed, like, whoa, where did all that come from? Or else somebody says to you, you know, I saw how you handled that situation, or I heard what you had to say. Man, you've really, you're pretty mature in your faith, and, whoa, me? What? What happened? How'd that happen? I, I love those moments. I love seeing those moments, and I love when they happen for me. Like, whoa, praise Jesus. All I did was start cooperating with him and doing what he told me to do on the days he told me to do it. And look what he's doing in my life. And even I'm amazed. God wants to work in our heart. He wants to work in our mind. He wants to work in our soul this year. This year. To help you mature a little more than you have. My question is, are you paying attention to how he's doing that? Paying attention to what is he doing in your life right now? And are you submitting to him and cooperating with him in this? Are you growing spiritually? (laughs) You don't want to be that, right? You don't want to be that. Are you growing spiritually? Are you being honest with God in yourself? Maybe, Maybe you're like, I don't, if I were really honest, I've never really... Ask Jesus to be my, my Lord and Savior. I'd, I've never really said, I believe, I really believe, and I've surrendered my life to him. Is Jesus the center of your life? If I'm honest, I'd say no, right? I mean, that, that's what I mean. That, maybe that's part of it. It's like, I need to start thinking about this. I need to go have a conversation with the pastor or whoever and say, I, I don't know if I really believe or not, to be honest. I don't want to offend my relatives. I don't want to offend so-and-so, but if I'm honest... Maybe God's calling you to trust in him, to step out on faith to what he's promised, to decide and confess that you believe and you want to be a follower of Jesus. Maybe you're embarrassed, like, I think people thought I already was, and I'm afraid to to go up after service and talk to the pastor because somebody might see it and might think that I don't. Who cares? (laughs) Raise your hand if you don't mind if somebody comes up to me after the service to talk with me about their walk with God and how it needs to improve. Anybody, if you don't mind, and that won't bother you at all, and you, you may even be encouraged by that. I got two hands over here. I got two hands. This guy can't even help himself. He's like, I don't mind. So don't let that hold you back. We, we love each other. We know we, gotta, we have to grow spiritually. We know that. Don't let that hold you back. Perhaps you're a young Christian right now and you're doing everything you can think of, right, to cooperate with God. You're trying to mature as a Christian. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I had talked to some of you and, you're, and, and I, I'm encouraged to hear it. You know, you're just like, like this guy. He was like, I've been reading through the Bible, but I have more questions. Can you hook me up with a study Bible or commentary? I just want to know a little bit more. I'm like, praise God. That's awesome. You're going to have a great year. <laughs> you're going to have a great year. That's awesome. 
I pray that God will continue to do his perfect work in your life and you'll cooperate with him through regular devotion time or more in-depth study or fellowship. Or I had a conversation with somebody else recently that said, you know, I was praying through my devotion time and I realized that I don't talk about the gospel very much. I, I'm asking myself, do, do I know how to explain the gospel and, and do I talk about it much with even my believing friends that are struggling with doubt or, or just life? You know, do I talk about it with them or, or my unbelievers, you know, the people that I work with? You know, I, I been, try to be an example. We talk about spiritual things here and there, but I've really spelled it out for them. I kind of wonder about that. And I, and I told them, I said, well, that's interesting timing because I just freshened up my recommended reading, and I've got a book on the shelf that might encourage you with that. It's called Gospel Fluency, Being Fluent in the, the Good News of the, of the Message of the Gospel. And I, re I really enjoyed this book, and so I'm like, I'll, I'll just put it out there for those that want to read. It's also an audible if you would prefer to listen. Maybe in general, you're like, you know what? I, if somebody challenged me on just different doctrines of the faith, I don't know what I would say. You know, maybe that's some area that I could grow in. What is the, you know, if it, what are all the scriptures that talk about the Bible, talk about the church, talk about? Maybe this is for you. 20 Basics Every Christian Should Know, Christian's Beliefs by Wayne Grudem. And you start to, if that's not enough for you. He's got another version that's that thick, and then he's got a version that thick. So to each their own. Maybe start with this one. You know, maybe you, right, you just get a, a commentary on, on a book of the Bible, um, Daily bread, right? Maybe that's where you're at. It's like, you know what? I, I'm not even reading nothing. You know, I just need a little help. Daily bread. Has a little devotion. Has scripture you can read. Pray about it. It's about growing. It's about, we also put out there too, a, a chronological Bible. You're like, I've never read the Bible from cover to cover. Maybe that's, that's what you need to do this year. I also put out there, too, uh, a couple of copies of little journals entitled Sermon Notes. Because like I said, for some of you, you're like, I, I feel like I'm already up to here with what's happening. And so I just say, hey, just make the most of it then. Make the most of it. When you come on Sunday, grab one of those journals, and then you can write down what the date is, the title of the message, and this passage, and just take some notes as, as you're listening. Maybe, maybe that's it. Don't do nothing. Don't do nothing. You're not going to grow spiritually if you do nothing. And maybe do something more. And again, I can't tell you what that is. Unless you want to come chat about it, that's fine. But right now, I just pray the Lord will speak to you because he knows exactly what he wants you to do. And he will help you do it. It won't be, it'll, it'll be, it'll take effort but it certainly won't be impossible, and it won't be too difficult. Not when you're on track with the Lord, and he's saying, okay, and you got it. I know what he wants me to do. Maybe for some of you, you're not growing because you, you're not doing anything. <laughs> you're like, oh, I know the Bible pretty well now, and I study, and I go, oh, Ray, that's awesome. Where are you serving? You're not serving anywhere? You're not doing anything? I got news for you. You get, you'll get stagnant if you're not serving. How many of you serve in some kind of either like physical way uh, at the church or uh, the community or something like that? Some spiritual though, and you're also involved in teaching, and, and you've grown through that. Or you remember the difference where like when I, when I wasn't serving and now I'm serving, there was a difference. I got challenged, as I just mentioned about children's church. So maybe that's you. It's like, you need to step out there and get involved and do something and grow in that. You need to be challenged in growing in what you know. How are you going to grow spiritually this year? I think this is what he's challenging them in. Is like, you've got to be mature. You've got to rise up. How are you going to cooperate with God and what he wants to do in your life? We have to press on toward maturity. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. 
who will mature us, who will mature us. And so let's ask him for that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time that we could be challenged. We could open ourselves up and say, God, please talk to me about something and help me understand your word better. Tell me what you want me to do this week. May I stay on track with you as I follow you and keep in step with you. What is it that you want me to do, Lord? Do you want me just to keep doing what you've already asked me to do? Then I'll be faithful to that. I'll keep doing what I'm doing. But Lord, if there's something extra that you want me to strive for, that will, I'll be blessed. And at some point, I'll be a blessing because I cooperated with you and allowed you to help mature me. Help us all, Lord. Help us all to be humble before you and to keep growing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Please stand with us.
Continue the good work that you started. We praise you for who you are, Father. We lift you up. You are so holy, and you are my king. I obey you, Father. You are my king, and you are my God. We love you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great week with the Lord. Yeah.